non a, a non scientist, um, non actually fish biologist. Um, but I think that uh, in light of the topics that we've been listening to all morning and the, the theme of this plenary, I think um, this is a great way to end. Dale Willman uh, is a uh, has spent his lifetime thinking about images in images, both as a journalist and a photographer. Uh, and he is an award-winning news anchor, editor, reporter, and trainer with decades, de decades of experience working around the world. With more than 15 years in Washington, D.C., he, he worked for NPR, CBS, and CNN. During the first Gulf War, he reported from London for NPR, providing coverage uh, for the IRA bombing campaign. And he anchored the only new NPR newscast ever from overseas. He's currently the program manager for the Resilient Science Journalism Fellowship Program at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at CUNY in New York City, and continues to anchor NPR new newscasts occasionally. And he's here to speak to us about communication, uh, particularly in light of uh, the climate science that we know. And he has a profound title. Mm -hmm. I feel that I will go down in history for this title as President of America, but I love it. Sure. Science the shit out of it. Communicating <laughs> like your life depends on it. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, 90 degrees in the room, and I'm the last speaker of the morning. What could go wrong? Uh, thanks for being here. I want to uh, say that I really love hearing my friend Tony talk about that. We talk about nature deficit disorder. Uh, somebody mentioned that this morning, and the fact that so many kids are not connected to nature. One of the things I love about that talk is that the language is, is so oral, so hearing, so image-placed, that it just seems difficult to me to imagine growing up in a community where the language connects you every day as you speak to the land. There must be immense value in that, so I'm always grateful to hear that. And if you have a chance to sit with him at lunch, ask him for the real story about the dam. It's an amazing story. So thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm going to read some notes over the first couple of slides, and I promise I'll get away from that, but I need to uh, uh, talk about some very specific things here. But I want to talk a little bit about communications, but I want to tell a personal story to get us there. Uh, so anytime I can be in the Adirondacks, I'm excited to be here. Um, We've lived up in this area for 20 years. We're part owner of a place called White Pine Campus. It's a photo taken last week at White Pine, which is about 30 minutes west of here. Uh, it sits on Osgood Pond, which is one of just 3,000 lakes and streams in the Adirondacks, lakes and ponds. Uh, since the late 1800s, visitors came to the Adirondacks for the mountain air and the mountain lakes, but 30 years ago, those lakes were under a cloud, literally. And the culprit was acid deposition. This is a personal story for me because I grew up where the acid problem basically began, but the story is one of hope and redemption as well, at least to some extent, we'll talk about that. But before I tell that story, we've got to understand a little bit about acid deposition or acid rain if you don't. So uh, acid rain is caused by the emission of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides from the combustion of fossil fuels. This comes from many different places, including natural sources, as climate deniers will tell you, volcanoes do emit sulfurs. Uh, sulfur dioxides and uh, uh, nitric oxides. But the primary culprit is that of power plants. Uh, and many of these resided in the Midwest. I grew up in Ohio. Where's the guy from Worcester? Went to Worcester College? I graduated from Smithville High School. That's seven miles. I love this sort of small world connection stuff. Anyway, uh, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois were the hotbeds for the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, oops, did I miss my... Uh, no? Okay, so in the 1960s, there were the reports here in the Adirondacks of rain falling that was at the pH of white vinegar. As you can see from the figures there, that's pretty severe. pH of 7 is considered neutral, white vinegar is 2.5. These are probably a bit of hyperbole, but nonetheless, the, the, the rains falling were, were quite acidic. Uh, this led to depletion of calcium, of magnesium, of aluminum from the soil. One of the problems with calcium is that it's needed, as you probably know, for many plants. The sugar maples need this because it helps them fight off the cold. But with this depleted, it's more difficult for the, for the uh, maples to grow. We're seeing problems in the western Adirondacks of large stands of maple where there is no uh, new growth coming up. And this is directly caused by the acid rain. 
The aluminum is another issue. Your fish biologist, they don't have to tell you what happens with aluminum gets into water bodies and how it affects fish. But what the acid rain does is it mobilizes the aluminum in the soil. And what often happens is it will build up at the edges of, of uh, lakes and the snow will fall. You'll have big accumulations in the winter. So not only is aluminum a problem in the lakes in general, but in the springtime with the thaw, you'll have a big pulse of this coming in and it would wipe out entire lakes, smaller lakes and ponds because of that huge pulse of aluminum coming through. And of course, there's the problem of mercury and lead. Lead was a problem in many communities here because of the pipes. The acid water coming, the acid rain coming in to their pipes and their water sources was leaching the lead. So people had very, very big problems with exposure to lead. So the reason why I want to talk about Ohio is because it sort of begins there. Uh, we had a governor named James Rhodes. He was elected governor in 1962, served two terms. He's well known for his uh, decision to send troops into Kent State in 1970, just before his second term ended, uh, the anniversary, the 50th anniversary that's coming up this uh, May 4th, by the way. Uh, but what, in my mind, he was uh, better known for was his role in propagating acid rain. Now, he's from southeast Ohio, which is high sulfur coal area. Lots of coal production there. It's also a poor area, as many coal production areas are. When he became governor, he wanted to increase jobs there. And he insisted that companies, power plants in the state, not only were burning coal, but had to burn Ohio coal, which is high sulfur coal. That created problems in Ohio. So uh, the acid was falling around uh, and, and creating problems with the land there. So he came up with a brilliant decision. Let's make the smokestacks taller. That was also codified to some extent in the Clean Air Act in, uh, in the 1970s. Uh, but this was his decision, and it, was, it had huge problems for the Northeast because with the smokestacks higher, it went into the uh, wind currents, which blew more of the uh, acid deposition to the east and to the Northeast, and especially to the Adirondacks. <coughs> and of course, this happens in these situations. No one accepted blame for this. These are two statements from, uh, from Rhodes. If acid rain's a problem of all, it's a national problem. We hear that uh, with uh, climate change and a lot of other issues now. Blaming Ohio for acid rain is like blaming Florida for hurricanes, um, as if a man-made thing is very similar to a natural event. Uh, and uh, corporations did the same sort of thing. The idea that uh, they would be taking the food from the mouths of people to give themselves a better view of the mountain was a pretty commonly held belief in uh, Ohio back in these times. So now comes the obligatory slide after I've gotten you very depressed about what's happening. Uh, this was a thing, uh, it took us in London or Scotland. In water there's bacteria, probably not in the lakes here when acid rain was at its highest peak. So how has this changed? This changed in part because of public outrage. And this is the thing I want you to understand. Media attention to the issue galvanized the public. It got them angry. And it led to politicians affecting change. And the science helped make that happen. Science is very important, and we all know why. Science knowledge has been increasing. We are in a world where we are awash in science knowledge, and it, it's almost overwhelming sometimes to try and understand it all. We're also in a world that I would imagine everybody in this room at least has a college education, if not an advanced degree. We need to remember that only one third of the people in the United States have degrees. Two thirds of the people do not. Their worldview is vastly different from ours. And their assimilation and their taking in of knowledge, especially scientific knowledge, is very different than ours. This was uh, a poll by uh, the National Science Foundation, a survey, and you can see the results. I don't need to read those to you. So this is how I sort of think, this is another gratuitous slide, this is how I sort of think of Americans at some times. Ears closed, their eyes closed, and just sitting in front of their phones. It's hard to take in scientific information. It's hard to understand scientific information. But here's why this is important again. So a, a brief history of the modern environmental movement in the US. 1962, the publishing of, who knows? Silence, rain, thank you. Of course, you're all fish biologists. You know this. <laughs> DDT, pesticides. It started a nascent movement in the country. Of course, Vietnam was going at the time. That drew a lot of energy, and rightfully so, toward that. But the fact that, that this environmental movement began was very critical. By 1969, there was more outrage. And remember, the Tet Offensive, which was huge in Vietnam, was 1968. Yet in 1969, two events occurred that really galvanized this environmental movement. 
the oil spill off the coast of California near Santa Barbara, and the burning of the Cuyahoga River about 45 minutes from where I grew up, with flames leaping off the river. Uh, that led to the first Earth Day. Gaylord Nelson was a uh, uh, senator from Wisconsin who came up with this idea. He hired a guy named Dennis Hayes to run the first Earth Day. They were ecstatic in hoping that there might be tens of thousands of people that showed up. They had millions of people. Wow. And frankly, it scared the shit out of politicians, <laughs> to put a fine tooth on it. I, in fact, it led to a number of pieces of legislation. It led to the forming of the EPA, NEPA, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act. How many think that uh, Nixon was an environmental president, by the way? This is, the, this is restoring history. He was not. He was not an environmental president. He was a political animal. And I, I checked with William Rucklesham, his first EPA administrator, about this specifically. And he concurred with this. What he did was he knew this was appropriate, but people forget he actually vetoed the Clean Water Act. He thought it was too expensive. He thought economically it was bad for the country, and that, that decision was overridden by Congress. 1978, Valley of the Drums in uh, Kentucky, Love Canal. I, I have a lot of connections with this. My family lived on Love Canal for six months, which I blame for the hair loss. Um, <laughs> that led to CERCLA, which is more commonly known as the Superfund legislation. 1984, Bhopal in India which led to the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act. Uh, and then 1990, this is the sort of the, the good story about acid rain. Uh, the amendments to the Clean Air Act led to uh, scrubbers, other things to take out particulates in the uh, 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 emissions from the power plants, and that drastically reduced the uh, sulfuric acid that was coming out, the sulfuric uh, oxides that were coming out and creating this acid rain. Now the problem is, of course, that there are two components, the nitrous oxides, and those also create problems. Those were not reduced. So what's happened in the Adirondacks is the acid has dropped uh, precipitously and it's plateaued because the nitrogen is still out there and it's still creating problems. So it's still an issue here. So in the meantime, all this is going on, and this is what we're going to get to about the responsibility of scientists to help inform the debate in the country. Journalists ignore, generally, the environment unless something major happens. So if there's not a crisis like Love Canal, like Valley of the Drums, oil spills off, uh, off of the coast of, of California, the environment is ignored. Content analysis shows very clearly it, the, the base level is about 2% of all coverage. Andrew Tyndall and Tyndall Report, if you'd like to see more of this, you should look at uh, his analyses of this. These graphs, the next couple slides are horrible. What I want you to look at is this in the bottom. So I have at the bottom here, you can see some events. 1989, a big spike. 1989, Exxon Valdez and Alar, which was a chemical that was sprayed on apples in Washington State to make them all ripen at the same time. It also was probably a carcin carcinogen. Uh, 2001, I believe it's Kyoto Protocol. 2010, uh, Deepwater Horizon, BP oil spill. You see the spike in coverage, but this is crisis coverage. It's not coverage that gives people information they need to know to understand the world around them. Same thing here. This again is horrible. I'm going to even look at it. Uh, but the top stories in the 2000s, Hurricane Katrina, crude oil, wildfires, influenza, winter weather. Same thing for 2018, which are the most recent numbers I could find. Wildfires, winter weather, hurricane, hurricane influenza. Again, these are all crises. This is what drives media coverage generally, are crises. Um, so this is what's important. In order to make change, in order to affect change on important issues, what has always been needed is consistent and sustained news coverage. I make a distinction between what I call news and journalism. News is a signalizing event. This just happened. Bus crash, wildfire, hurricanes bearing down on us, or, you know, maybe like a big winter storm that's going to keep a lot of people stuck in Lake Placid. <laughs> I'm just saying. But these are, these are news events that are happening right then. But journalism is the information that layers the context onto it, that helps people greater understand the issues around them. It's why I worked for so long at NPR, because I think of all the uh, news organizations out there, they're among the best doing this. But it's important to understand that we need that level of coverage. But journalists don't understand these issues. There's a lot, there are a lot of environmental journalists, there are a lot more who are not. So you also need to understand something called agenda setting. And this is that the media don't tell the public what they think about. But the stories that they select, or I'm sorry, don't, need, don't tell you what to think, but the stories they select tell you what to think about. It's top of mind, it's what everybody's talking about, and that's why 
these discussions occur. This is why we talk so much about crisis covers. This is why we talk so much about Kim Kardashian. These are the things that you hear in the media constantly, and it sort of gets a collective consciousness going in the conversations. So, now what? First of all, you've got to get out of the ivory tower. <laughs> Sorry, I love stupid little cartoons. But the ivory tower syndrome, you know, it's the tenure track, it's a lot of other reasons. Some would say, I would not, but some would say that scientists or people are more comfortable in front of a microphone than they are in, in front of a microscope, rather, than they are in front of a microphone. Uh, you need to get over that. You need to understand that this is not what journalists are about. How many engage regularly with journalists in your work? I, I, I already know that no one from DEC will be raising <laughs> Anyone else? I was, I was in Glens Falls uh, a few years ago, and I was driving someplace, and I just saw something. As a citizen, I don't remember what it was, something was interesting, and just around the corner was the DEC office. I thought, I'm going to ask them what it is. So I stopped in, somebody comes up, and said, yeah, I'm really curious about this back there. Who are you? Well, my name's Dave Wilk. Why, why are you interested? Well, I, I, I do environmental journalism, and I'm just really interested in this. Oh, thanks. I can't talk to you, and now I have to write a report back to the governor's office that you've been stopped in here. <laughs> so, I love you guys, I know you can't say much. Although, it is illegal, if it's been shown by the Supreme Court that you cannot have your First Amendment rights removed, but I understand the pressure to instead goes to do so. So, let's talk about engaging the media. So, I'm going to talk about two levels here. I understand not everybody is comfortable in talking to the media. Not because we're weird, bat boy kind of creatures, but because it's a difficult thing to do. But if you are willing to, there are many things you can do. And very simple things. Congratulate good coverage. Reporters don't hear this. You know, it's, it's, when I'm at a restaurant, I tend to, when people are really, really good, I tend to go up and thank the manager. It always freaks them out. Yes, I like to talk about the service. What? And they get very angry. And, then, and I say, look, this is really fantastic. They did a great job. And it sort of throws them, because everybody wants to complain. Nobody wants to tell you you're doing it right. Talk to reporters. More importantly, talk to the editors who assign reporters. You tell them how great that story is. You tell them why it's significant. They may assign more of that, more of that coverage. Call about poor coverage, too. Let them know in a polite way when something has been badly done. No matter how angry you are about that coverage, try and put it in a, in a, in a good way so people can learn from that. Cultivate relationships. This is a really important aspect. You know, it's that you don't know a reporter, you don't know a reporter, suddenly get a phone call and you're in panic mode because the reporter's on the phone. And get to know the reporters in your communities. Take them out to lunch and buy lunch because they don't get paid much anymore. Uh, but, but take them out to lunch and just say, I want to chat. So you develop a relationship before the person calls you on the phone and becomes more necessary. <coughs> Uh, become a trusted source for information. There was a guy named Earl Holland. I went to Ohio State University, go Bucks. Uh, and Clemson screwed us out of that title, but don't, I'm not bitter. Uh, but, but uh, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, but there was a guy named Earl Holland who did uh, science communication there. Earl was known around the country. He was the father of that sort of practice at universities because you would call and say, I'm interested in X. And he'd say, well, we got this guy over here. But I think what you're looking for the guy who's really, really covering that deeply is not at Clemson, but he's over at Washington State or, or wherever. And so Earl became a really trusted source. The reporters knew that he would be straight with them. And that's really important. You want to have a relationship with a journalist where they understand you and they know that you're going to be fair with them. So when you do call and say, you know, that was a problem and here's why, they're going to listen. Uh, and encourage your colleagues to do the same thing. Put stories in terms of people and not data. And this is tough, and I'm going to show you a, a slide in a few minutes that's a perfect example of this. But people don't relate to things. You talk to them about fish, maybe. You talk to them about uh, depletion of, a, of, a, of an ecosystem around a stream, their eyes are going to glaze over them. They're going to sort of roll in the back of their heads. But I used to work with a trainer who had this saying, particularly about audio, that, that God gave us eyelids but not earlids which gave a particular strength for audio to get into your head and, and, and into your gut. So when you tell a story about people, it grabs people viscerally. I know that. My grandmother had to deal with that. Then you can start introducing the science. So get out of your heads. No TLAs. That's what we call them in Washington. Three-letter acronyms. EPA, you know, CBS, CNN. Three-letter acronyms, four-letter acronyms. 
get out of the jargon. Remember who your audience is. People this morning had a lot of jargon in their talk, and that's great, because that's the audience. The general public reporters, not so much. Identify local connections to the issue when you can, which of course you are because you're living out in the community. <laughs> Taking part in editorial meetings is a really, really important thing if you're comfortable with doing this. A lot of newspapers in particular will have editorial meetings, like a monthly thing where they might invite someone in from the community. Well, ask them if you can come in and talk about your knowledge about a particular issue in that community. It's non-threatening, tell them it's off the record, uh, that you just want to help educate. And often they'll just do it over lunch and they'll have a lot of the editors in, some of the reporters, and it's a great way to have a conversation. with them. But some people just still have a visceral response to journalists. My last picture was, well, not my last picture was slight, sorry. Um, so there are other things you can do. You can talk with neighbors, talk with your neighbors about these things, and I'm sure most of you do this already. You're part of a community. You can help to educate your community. Start a conversation or discussion group. Yeah, about 15 years ago, I was working on a project that failed for some other reasons I won't talk about. But the idea was, back then, people only talked about climate change in terms of polar bears. And the reality was, even then, there were changes that were visible within the continental US that we could talk about. So we were trying to do a series of stories about those. And I happened to bump into a guy on an airplane from the National Council of Churches in North Carolina. Now, when you think about discussions, when you think about conversations, where do they happen? They happen in barber shops, beauty parlors, and they happen in churches. So what we had planned was we were going to take these stories, package them, with some written materials to go with them, and we were going to send a copy to every member of the National Council of Churches in North Carolina. The idea being that they would do one of two things with these. They would either take them, the ministers would use them as fodder for, for sermons. What we hoped is they would, they would create a discussion group around these. It's non-threatening, it's your peers, it's your tribes. We won't even get into tribalism, it's a whole other thing in this country now. But it's a way of persuasion and of, of informing in a non-threatening setting where people are comfortable with that kind of a conversation. And be creative. In Toronto they had something they called breakfast with eggheads. And I love this idea. It was with the, uh, uh, the government officials there. Once a month, I don't know if they're still doing it, but once a month they would pick a topic they would go into the legislature, they would bring them breakfast. You get the food is important here. They would bring them breakfast, and they would just have a conversation about that topic. So the lawmakers who are making these decisions, remember, lawmakers don't grow balls and do what's right. They wait till the public outcry. We think Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Earth Day. That's what's going to drive them. But if they have more knowledge that they can use in their legislating, that's also of immense value. You can do that in that sort of process. Science on Tap. Let me see my next slide that has this. We'll talk about this. But Science on Tap, I don't know, do any of you have this in your community? This is a relatively new thing. I think it's a great idea. Sustainable Saratoga does it down in uh, where I live in Saratoga Springs. And what they do is they will have a gathering at a bar, and they will have a speaker. And it's social, and it's hanging out, but they'll have people talk about important issues. Again, it's a way of getting people in to talk. The difficulty is that's sort of a self-selecting group. You've got the environmental group sending the stuff out. You're going to get people who are already interested in these issues. And you want to expand that, which is why I love the church idea. But nonetheless, it's another way that you can get engaged without having to be in front of the media, without standing at a microphone, without